Wow, you've cooked quite a soup for me here with these questions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I got a little few confused with the questions about gays and fairies that they're here. Different, have diff they have different meaning, I understand from the questions. Sorry. Goodness. Fortunately, there's enough here I can pick and choose. <laughs> there's one very easy one here. It's a kind of perennial question. Why can women not be elected to the House of Justice? <laughs> but the questioner gives me a way out. He says, what is the wisdom behind this? And I can directly quote, the master says, the wisdom of this will become known in the future. It's a direct quote. And as far as I can see, the future is not here yet, so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Can you please briefly explain again about congregational prayer? Did I explain anything? I was, maybe I did. Congregational prayer, friends, uh, the law of Baha'u'llah prohibiting congregational prayers except the prayer for the dead is a form of congregational prayer where there's a ritual action on the part of the congregation. Uh, in Islam, there is a prayer leader. He stands in the front. He says the obligatory prayer. And everybody else does the motions. That has been superseded. And Baha'u'llah says each should do the obligatory prayer for themselves. It doesn't refer to us singing verses of God together or praying all in a group or praying all simultaneously. It does not refer to those. Those things are all acceptable and they're all right. And in fact, they're encouraged. I've seen tablets of that before where he says both sitting all together, listening to the prayers together, of course, is fine. And then he says at a later stage in the, the visit to the Mashakal Askar, let them all sing together the verses of God. The uh, singular exception to this congregational prayer is the prayer for the dead, where Baha'u'llah establishes that those present at the time that the prayer for the dead with the repetitive verses is being recited that the congregational part of that is that everyone present stand not that everyone present say the prayer together with the people that are saying the prayer it's, it's an action of standing in respect Oh, here's a good one. I hadn't seen this one. Does the revelation of Baha'u'llah appear on other planets? Uh, yes, as far as I know, surely it will or has or is yet to come in other places, but not from Baha'u'llah, from other universal manifestations. Because we have letters that say, Baha'u'llah is the universal manifestation for this planet. And Mr. Olinga told me that the guardian told him and for the first stages of all of our existence in the other world. Baha'u'llah is the center of that. Um, I think the, the implications of that, if we don't, you know, if I don't go too far with it, is the, that eventually a prophet of God will come who will unite the solar system. And that there may well be other civilizations on other planets in our solar system. We just, we don't know those things yet. Someone asked Baha'u'llah about it, and I understand he in a tablet said it's premature to, to state that. How should you go about respectfully throwing away the words of God, prayers and writings? Um, not sure what exactly is meant by that. I th maybe it means you tell somebody don't throw them in the garbage. That's okay, you could burn them, you could keep them. 
I don't, I don't know how, what more I can, the implications of that, what else we can say. How do you teach an individual who does not believe in God? I don't know, I'm kind of of a mind to congratulate them on being sensible. <laughs> because I remember Mr. Fortan saying, a communist roommate of his got suspicious that he believed in God when he was studying in Moscow. It's forbidden to believe in God in, in university in Moscow. So he accused him, he said, you believe in God, don't you? Mr. Fortan said, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. <laughs> and that's more or less the station of the atheist. They've got some, we've, there's so many crazy ideas about God out there that they reject them. They say, we also say it's impossible to know God. So that might help to be a bridge in a conversation rather than looking aghast, why don't you believe in God? To what extent the members of the present Universal House of Justice can give advice to friends outside of the house, which is still special. Um, I don't know, you're saying present House of Justice, you have to ask them. I can tell you about the past House of Justice. We all had our individual ideas and views, and I heard enough of them around the table to know that they can't all be consistent. So I think you have to think in terms of all of us, former present House members, we can maybe give you some idea, point you in some direction, but don't, don't take it as guidance and don't take it as necessarily as guidance of the House of Justice. Weigh it into your circumstances, look and see. I, for one, promise to not be offended. Well, this is a difficult one. I'm sure it's everybody's question here. Do you have any suggestions for prioritizing activities? Especially when it comes to family time, community time, institutions, neighborhoods, work, personal study, and teaching. It's hard to know what to focus on. Thank you so much. Um, Everything is here but prayer. I would say prioritize by putting prayer first, asking for guidance. What do you do about all these things? Because the circumstances of each individual is different. I think we've uh, touched, I hope we've touched in the course of the, the week on all these different facets. And one has to decide. The circumstance of one person's life may suggest prioritizing this and, and others in other, in other directions. It's pretty hard to give a... Uh, you know, pre-baked answer to that. Here's an easy one. Could Mr. Dunbar give reference for the statement of Abdul Baha about the span of human life being 120 years intended span? Thank you so much. Uh, being 120 years. I can't, no, I can tell you I heard it from Persian friends in the House of Justice, out of the House of Justice, hands of the cost. But I don't know, uh, the source of it hasn't been published in English. So you'll have to take it as hearsay or pilgrim note but keep it in your file somewhere until till you get it confirmed. Or turn to, next to you to one of the Persian scholars and ask them where it is. That's it. How can a Baha'i that has strayed so far from the faith come back to it? Especially if he slash she, not revealing anything, right? <laughs> no longer feels the guidance and presence of Baha'u'llah. Is it ever too late? Well, oh, friends, never too late, no. I mean, you think of the 
heinous crimes of Mirza Yahya, the half-brother of Baha'u'llah, what he did to Baha'u'llah, besides trying to destroy his faith, countering his revelation as a prophet of God at a time when that's difficult enough to believe, but countering it with his own revelation, saying he was God and he was revealing and he was the proper one that the Bab had announced. Then the end of the Akdas, Baha'u'llah says, if he repents and turns back, he'll be forgiven. The mercy of God encompasses all of us. So I don't think you can come up with something so bad that it can't be forgiven. And basically that's the problem that we have is, is our hesitance to ask for forgiveness. I mean, we need to, you have to make the step, as far as I understand, of repentance. If you can do that, you fix anything. You can fix anything. Look at Mary Magdalene. What an example. She becomes the champion of the disciples. She says, Abdu'l-Baha says, she revived the apostles after the death of them. And she had a fairly difficult background, as you're aware. So I think it's never too late. And is that an air conditioner? No longer feels the guidance and presence of Baha'u'llah. Well, you could ask your friends to pray for you too. Maybe that would help. Does Abdul Baha make reference to passing down of the faith to children from one of the parents or both? Please direct me to the right quote or guidance. Please elaborate the role of fathers in young families. Thanks. Um, I didn't know anything. I don't know anything about that. There's lots of, you know, history of what the Persians call Baha'i Zadehs, the children of Baha'is. But I always spoke to the youth in the World Center that they had to make the faith their own, even if they got it from their parents. I was fortunate they had knowledge of it. But that knowledge had to become internalized. That knowledge had to become their own. This is my religion. What are you? I'm a Baha'i. My parents are Baha'is and I'm a Baha'i. That's not enough. It has to go beyond that. So one has to really sort it out for themselves. And because that's such an essential step, it's been related to 15-year-olds reaffirming their position in the cause. Certainly they're Baha'i children up to that time. They're raised in Baha'i families. That, that would be the way I would view that. Um, there was another related question of that sort. I'll see if I have it here. See it at the moment. Let's maybe show up here. Could you please give more details about the teaching method of Abdul Baha, which you referred to as the best that we have? The letters of Shoghi Fendi says to study the uh, method, master the method of Abdul Baha's talks in the West. So it's really looking at the talks, the way he addressed the public, the way he addressed the Baha'is in meetings across Europe and across North America. I think that's the, the secret of it. Uh, it's very interesting if you make your own compilation of thematic, a thematic breakdown of subjects from the talks. You know, the talks are in a date order, but they're not sequential in development. They're different. Indeed, Shoghi Effendi says that towards the latter part of Abdul Baha's visit, the talks became more superficial as he found that the capacity of the public was not what I first imagined. You know, Shoghi Effendi has mentioned, he's talking about it, and I remember the first time I read this, I was startled. He said, Abdul Baha's mission to the West was a failure. You get to what? <laughs> then he he saw the friends respond to the table, it seems, and he said, not Abdu'l-Baha's failure. It was the failure was the failure of the people. 
uh, the estimates made from the centenary year that are that about 90,000 people heard Abdu'l Baha in person, saw him and heard him speaking. What excuse did the nation have that it stayed totally asleep? You know, you wonder who even friends of the faith. What happened? They praise and talk about how wonderful the meeting was and go out and try to find the best chocolate ice cream or something. And life goes on with, without a hitch. What's that? He warned them. He said, I warned them about the coming war. I told them it was coming. Oh, nobody understood. He talked about the two kinds of civilization, too much material civilization, not enough spiritual civilization. They didn't heed his advice. Nobody took that advice seriously. And we went plunged into that dark war, which really endangered Abdul Baha as well. He was under direct threats from the Turks during that period. Jamal Pasha, the military head of the Turkish army in that part of the, of the uh, Ottoman Empire, said that he was going to himself personally crucify Abdul Baha on Mount Carmel. Imagine. Can you explain the significance or importance of the two, four, and six winged angels you referred to in your talk um, on day one? Well, I told you what I knew about the two winged ones. I don't know any four winged ones. The six winged ones, the reference in the tablet, which is in Persian and published, but not translated and published in English, are those that enjoy, enjoy the immediate presence, that circle around the throne of Baha'u'llah, that attend to the immediate uh, high spirit of devotion. And the fourth was the four winged was somewhere in the middle. But again, you ask one of your Persian friends if they can find that, because it is. I, I've quoted part of it in uh, Companion to the Study of the Egon. There's a cross-reference to where you can find the tablet actually there. That's the best I can do for you. While I was serving at the World Center, Mr. Fortan referred to two letters written by the Guardian. One, 10th of June, 1957, the 2nd, 24th October, 1957, referring or alluding to chief stewards of the cause and taking the reign of the faith. Can you kindly inform where we can find the source? And uh, then he says, can we say these two letters in a way can act as his will? Never heard any reference to these really constituting his will. I have heard Rhea Conum say, and she's written indeed in priceless pearl that Shogifani in many ways considered the dispensation of Baha'u'llah, his letter to the West, as his testament that set forth the true balance and station of the central figures of the faith and of the administration of the cause. So that's, that's one to look at. The establishing of the uh, role of the chief stewards of the embryonic world order. Now embryonic world order is the administrative order. The administrative order is the embryo of the world order. So chief stewards of the embryonic world order was chief stewards of the administrative order. And that was taken sufficiently as authority by the Israeli officials and bank officials and so on to hand over the whole interest of the cause to the body of the representatives of these chief stewards, which was the hands in the Holy Land at that time, an institution that the hands brought into being to govern Baha'i affairs during the interregnum, the five years between the passing of the guardian and the establishment of the Universal House of Justice. Both of those letters would have, uh, and I'm, I'm not uh, immediately aware of the 10th of June 1957 letter as having anything to do with this, but you can find them both in Messages to the Baha'i World, a volume of 
that the American National Assembly has published of the letters of Shoghi Effendi from 1951 until his passing in 1957. It was a very important volume of letters to read in any case. But this was very fortuitous that the Guardian mentioned this particular phrase. Sufficient was the will and testament to establish the fact because it says the hands of the cause will at all times um, be in the service of the Guardian, in the work of the Guardian. So that, that's there. Uh, you know, sometimes questions are stated in a way you're not sure. And they say such a thing is this, and so what is this? But the what's a thing is this is already a little bit, a little bit wonky, a little bit off the, <laughs> off the focus. For instance, it says in Hawaii they changed the age of, age of maturity from 15 to 16. I don't think that, I don't know who, which Hawaiians did that, but uh, you don't change the revelation. The revelation establishes the age of maturity as 15. But it seems administratively they wanted to give an extra year for students and young people to decide whether they were going to be Baha'is, participate in Baha'i activities. This one says, my daughter at 15 stopped participating in Baha'i activities because a couple of people kept pushing her to sign the card. Now she gets an extra year of harassment. How is it that they are allowed to change Baha'u'llah's explicit law? What I think, you understand what the answer to that is. That they're not allowed to do that. And it's still for the individual youth to decide if they want to affirm. It's not a question of signing a card, it's an attitude of faith that's in the heart. It becomes legalized through signing a card which gives you the preparation for eventually becoming a voting member of the community. And you can see how important it is that we know who the Baha'is are and whether they're, they're, they have their voting rights in order so that they can elect delegates and delegates can elect national assemblies and national assemblies can elect the Universal House of Justice. So, so all of you as voting Baha'is, all of you that are Baha'is, are the foundation of that. Shoghi Fendi said that the resting place of the greatest holy leaf was a model of this whole thing. The bricks on the bottom, that's us. All of us are like the bricks. The first steps are the local spiritual assemblies. The columns, the nine columns of that monument with the dome that you see in the gardens in front of the House of Justice. That, uh, those, are, those pillars, he said, are the pillars, are the secondary houses of justice or present day national spiritual assemblies. Then he said the dome which will be placed on top of those pillars, sustained those pillars, sustaining that dome is the universal house of justice. If you look at that also, if I can introduce a thought of my own, there's this very plain, everything's very elaborate but there's a very plain button on the top of the of the House of Justice and then there's these rays of light coming out over it. I always think that that was the very subdued way the Guardian represented the guardianship in that particular model. But you, you can look pictures of that and see what you think. Why must all work diligently towards racial unity? But what of the power of diversity? Uh, I don't think there's a contradiction. It's the unity of our belief in one God which creates the oneness of mankind. And it's enhanced by the diversity. As Abdu'l Baha says, the garden is the garden and it's filled with plants of different character and different fragrance and different colors. So that's this really, diversity is what constitutes, if you will, the basis of this amazing oneness of humankind that we have in the world. The Bab foretold the promised one, Baha'u'llah, in the Maori language of New Zealand, it said, Tenopai Te Atua. 
Are we to learn at least five languages? I think maybe you have to ask yourself that. I, we are called upon to learn whatever languages we need to teach the, the cause. I've seen references to Abdu'l-Bah saying that children by the time they're 10 should know four languages. Capacity of young people, children and young people to learn languages is amazing. Uh, we have the call of Baha'u'llah to establish a universal auxiliary language. You realize, friends, that that auxiliary language is a principle we have, but we don't say what language it is to be. In fact, in the Guardian's the references to the subject and in, in the tablets also uh, it says that uh, it might be an existing language or it could be a, create, a language that's created or simplified from one of the existing languages. In any case it's up to the representatives of all the nations of the world gathered in a world congress, a world parliament at the time of the establishment of the lesser peace to decide about that principle if they want to adopt or urge the adoption universally of one of the languages. The House of Justice has a separate function is called on later to establish a single language and a single written text to serve the Baha'i world. But the implications of that they wouldn't, we wouldn't do that until much later where we're a majority of people in the world or a majority of people in a number of nations we could think the House of Justice may want it will be its choice as to when it would address such a matter so think in your mind that there's two stages to this the adoption universally of an auxiliary language and later the specification of a single language by the House of Justice but a big time lapse in the middle to see how things develop. This is an interesting question. I'm glad someone asked it because sometimes I'm hearing strange things in this area and it would be good to maybe have a view on this. Is the guidance of Shoghi Effendi about how the individual might be most effective in teaching the faith still relevant today? You think now, this is the kind of thing you need to meditate about a little bit when you hear it. People would say, oh, the House of Justice guides us today, not Shoghi Effendi. I've seen some reference, Shoghi Effendi was the uh, previous leader of the Baha'i faith. Please, God. We don't fall into such an understanding. He was the guardian of the cause of God. He was the sign of God on earth. He was the only individual after Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha qualified to say what the purpose of God in the verses of God means. And if he established an uh, effective way of teaching, as far as I know, nobody should vary from that. And we would be contradicting the House of Justice itself if we said it was different now than before. We may do, may simplify the version, we may have a step start way we're doing it to get to this standard, but the standard is that established in the advent of divine justice. And the House of Justice has been rep repeatedly, all during this 20 year period, repeatedly referring to the to the advent of divine justice and looking to it and study the advent of divine justice and study these passages about the teaching. So I think you can lay to rest the fact that it somehow has shifted. Because Shoghi Effendi was right on top of interpreting the purpose of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha. Any case, that's my private view of the matter. You can ask your National Spiritual Assembly if you're not happy with that answer for any reason. This is written partly in Spanish. It's a, a translated. It says you can see the lack of uh, respect on the part of youth and their disobedience to their parents and ask how that can be resolved. Mm -hmm. 
Seems to be a question on the part of some parent, don't you think? Probably. <laughs> uh, the writings are quite clear, clear that, that we should have respect for our parents. Always. We should always respect our parents. We're not obliged to follow them in every action. There was a question yesterday of the youth. Of, Do I have to have parental consent for a boyfriend or a girlfriend? No, you're free after the age of discretion, after the age of maturity, you're free to start to think, to, to find a partner, to choose a partner, to investigate the character of different people. That, they need to be left free. Now hopefully the training that the parents have given would suggest to the youth certain qualities they would want to look for in a marriage partner. The hand, the, um, in the early institution of the teaching center, several new counselors were added after the original ones. One was Isabel Sabri, Mrs. Sabri. She and her husband, Hassan Sabri, had been pioneers from that very early period in 1951 in the African campaign. They were established in Uganda and were helping with the national, as members of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Central and East Africa. Uh, at one point, um, Hassan was busy with his work and couldn't get away, but Isabel was able to make a pilgrimage. They had a son that was a teenager coming along, and Mrs. Mayberry was also at the table when, they, when Isabel asked, show you, Fendi, what are the good qualities, what are those qualities that a young man or a young girl should look for when investigating the character? of a potential spouse. And he's, to their surprise, he's, he looked surprised. He said, good qualities? No, no. You must investigate the bad qualities. <laughs> Everyone can live with the good qualities, but the bad qualities, you have to assess them and decide whether you're going to be able to live with them the rest of your life or not. <laughs> Very important distinction there, <laughs> helpful. When we are, you know, romantically inclined and in love, we don't look for the bad qualities. It takes a couple months into the marriage before you figure those out. <laughs> what happens to the souls of Baha'is who are aborted under the embryos made by artificial insemination and frozen have souls and what happens to the souls of the embryos who are discarded uh, the house of justice hasn't found anything in the teachings to nail down the second part of this about the uh, frozen embryos and so on but as far as the souls of babies um, Abdul Baha says they, the, these infants, these embryos are are sinless. They come without any markings of any sort. So when they go to the next world, they go in a pure form. They, ha they haven't had a chance to sign a declaration card, but that isn't really the point, is it? They go to the next world, and Abdu'l-Baha reassures a woman who is lamenting the loss of her small baby. He says that your little girl has gone to the kingdom and will be educated and trained in the schools of the kingdom and you will meet her beautiful, fully grown when you enter the next world, when you go to the next world. So that's very reassuring. What we want to avoid is not meeting the ones that were not, that's pretty heavy, but anyway, the ones that might have been aborted that shouldn't have been aborted. <laughs> and they're gonna ask us, why, why did you abort me? <laughs> it's not the, you know, there's no connection. There is connection. People know who, who each other are in the next world. We all have our identity. We're going to have to face up to the, some of the histories that, that exist, so on. But uh, I think that many, if there are many people that have gone through that process, that they have no doubt turned to the mercy of God and asked forgiveness for that, and it'll get straightened out in the next world. Uh, this is about let, 
deeds, not words, be your adorning. Could you perhaps throw some light on a thought I have? What if one thinks that through their thoughts and words that these are like deeds? Yes, I think sometimes maybe words of advice or loving counsel to others may constitute a, a deed. I don't know if that would be enough in itself. We're trying to also learn how to behave ourselves in the midst of all this and conform our lives to the teachings progressively, step by step. Okay, first this is, what's the most appropriate way for Baha'is to respond to questions about gay marriage? I think you, you really need to look at the letters of the House of Justice. There are two quite substantial letters that came out earlier this year. One thing that uh, has been shifting over the last decades, I think it's always been there because we're told we must love everyone, but the House has emphasized it more and more, how we have to, we don't, we're not homophobic, we're not against anybody for their shortcomings or their changes or their lives or their outlook or their position uh, on different issues. That, that's not what we're about. We're about loving everyone. We're about expressing the love and the hope of mankind for the future. We're also not about telling non-Baha'is how they should behave or what they should be doing. We say that that is a function at present of government and how strongly Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Baha'u'llah say obey government. So we're supportive of whatever the government decides, that's fine. If they say there's gay marriage, fine, let there be gay marriage. We do have teachings within our own faith which explain to us that the main definition of people is not dividing them into homosexual or heterosexual. They're not sexual entities. They do have gender, yes, they do have challenges and problems, we're all reading about that these, these days, but basically it's their spiritual reality that the revelation of God addresses, how to raise people up to be at a more noble character, and it prescribes certain teachings to assist them to get to that goal, and that doesn't include gay marriage. But you don't have to tell them the second part, you just tell them the first part, we support civil law especially if they don't know anything about Baha'u'llah. You don't want to test people, you know, if they're going to reject the whole Baha'i faith because of this aspect, this particular teaching. That's not, that's not wise teaching, you know. Come at it a little slowly. They may push you and they may say, yes, but what do you say about this? What do you say about that? And can you do this? And is this sexual activity acceptable or not acceptable? We have some books on those subjects, some teachings about it. We believe chastity is a means of elevating the soul and important that we try to address that. Then the one about fairies. What is the stance of the faith on fairies? <laughs> the writings mention the concourse on high and had maintenance and others. Only asking because Going to the Steiner schools, there is an emphasis on fairies or fairy-like beings. Or so this is something quite different from the last question, as far as I understand. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I'm afraid I know even less on this subject than I <laughs> on that. I wish I could tell you something, but we know the, the, this, as far as I understand, the angels of the next world although we can't say that God is limited to beings of any sort. We know there's a whole hierarchy of, of manifestations of God of different degrees and their inner state is all one, but their outer state is prescribed by God and established in, in different stages, in different periodic distributions of, of revelation and power. But um, Shogi Effendi says that in Islam they talk about uh, what do they talk about what's the name the genes like you know the genie like the genie in the bottle that you read about in Aladdin and the lamp they're also human souls these are also there's only human souls there's not an, another category of 
of beings of that sort, as far as I understand from the reading of the tablets that I've done so far. I was teaching method of Abdul Baha. I think that you have to explore that yourself. Think about it a lot. See how he answered questions. Some of the talks end with questions, and you see how the master answered them. Oh, this is about how to detach ourselves from the materialistic world. I try my best to detach myself from possessions and my business, but sometimes I find myself attached, too, atta too detached, and seem to fall into a state where it doesn't all matter to me at all. I feel like what I'm doing is drowning myself in prayers, I think it says something like that. Where do you draw the line? How do you make sure everything is coherent with everything else? When the writings say to give importance to the word of God, when you look back at the beloved master who sacrificed his whole life serving and giving, when martyrs like Badi so joyfully gave up their life for the love of God, how do I justify myself even for one moment to think about myself and work forward my business to live comfortably? How can I not give everything to the fund and serve 24-7? Uh, then I'm left with nothing to live with. Friends, if you serve 24-7, you won't need to bother about anything else, I don't think. You'll soon drop dead. So I would, <laughs> that's a nice, that's proper attitude, but Abdul Baha does say, don't sleep for enjoyment, it says sleep to recover your energy so you can continue to serve. So there, you have to eat to do that. Shoghi Effendi says, guard your health, you need your health if you're going to serve the cause. He advised some of the teachers who were exhausted, he said, take a time and recover your health before you go on. So it's all, it's all, nobody can judge us, but it's all a ma matter of measuring. And it's a question of trust and faith that you, that you have in, in dealing with these questions. Very, very serious matters. Everybody should be thinking about this, you know. Reading the guidance from the tablets, reading the guidance from the guardian, reading the guidance from the House of Justice and deciding where does my life fit in this? Obviously there's different stages of our life where there's special attention has to be given to what's before us. Many of us have the challenge of studying. They have to finish your studies. But maybe as Shoghi Fendi said to one young woman in California that I knew, she wanted to uh, teach the faith. And her parents were saying, study in the university. You know? And he said that since you speak Swedish, it would be wonderful if you could go to Sweden. And hopefully later you will be able to go on with your education. So this one kind of guidance. And another one, he says, you should finish your degree. You'll be of great service in your field. There's no single answer to these things, you know. So when the House of Justice is asked these questions, it usually refers them back to the individual. It says, this is ultimately for you to decide. You have the wonderful opportunities before you. The House of Justice will pray that you can discover the right, right formula, the right pattern for the future. So to kind of, if you write the House of Justice, that's usually the answer you're going to get. Maybe you write them and they say, it would be wonderful if you could go to Iceland. I don't know. <laughs> or Borneo or some place else. We don't. But that doesn't happen very often. And it usually happens because the house knows very well the circumstances of the individual and addresses it. And the, the last question, friends, is very simple. Why Baha'i? Interesting question. I think this may be a, 
one of the friends of the faith has asked, asked about this. Why Baha'i? Why Baha'i? That's a good question all of us need to ask ourselves. Why Baha'i? Why am I a Baha'i? Am I just a Baha'i because my grandparents and my father parents were Baha'is? Am I a Baha'i because I really like good times with the Baha'is? I have so much fun with the Baha'is. What, why Baha'i? I don't know, I think you have to go back to the higher level. You have to say, why Baha'i? Because of the universal scheme of redemption that God has established in the course of the development of the planet. From Adam on, he has been sending messengers until he brought it to consummation with Baha'i, with Baha'u'llah. And so if you have any influence in your life of these previous messages, you'll want to know how it's bearing fruit at the time that we live in through the message that Baha'u'llah has brought. But that's the significance of it. Uh, those that are Baha'is be believe that the faith of God is eternal. Eternal in the past, eternal in the future. It's one faith of God. The Muslims had the same kind of teaching. You know, they said, they say, Abraham was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. It upsets the other people, the Bible, <laughs> the biblical st students and things. But it's true. Because a Muslim means one who submits to the will of God. In that sense, we're all Muslims. We can even say that. I mean, in a sense, you want to explain it to people. If you have a Muslim friend, you can say, we're all Muslims. That's true. In that sense that we all are trying to be submissive to the will of God. And all the people have always been one people. Though they've been raised and, and uh, educated in different folds, so to speak. Uh, I'll, I'll put a question to you now that I've been thinking about and I don't know the answer to it. Baha'u'llah says he has come to unite all who are in the heavens and all who are on the earth. What does that mean? Is there some plan of unity for the next world? Or do we imagine that the next world is all, the next stage we go to is all perfection? I don't see any of that in the writings. It is the world much more perfect than this world, but it seems we still have challenges. There's one tablet of uh, the Lohi Saya, which God commands Baha'u'llah, tell them about your visit in the realm of the spirit. And Baha'u'llah says, I went in the realm of the spirit and I visited different groups. One group was arguing about, in the next world, arguing about which of the names of God is the highest and most important name of God. And I came amongst them with, with love and wanted to share the knowledge of, of God with them. And they didn't pay any attention. He said, I stayed around about a month and then I left and went and found another group. And they were discussing the movements of the obligatory prayers. And they were stuck on that for all eternity. I don't know. <laughs> Finally, he found another group. They caught on fire with, with his message. And they said that... Uh, Ere long, all who are on earth will be enlisted under these banners that Baha'u'llah That's where that prophecy about when he entered Akka, the question of the banners that would, under which everyone would be enlisted in the future is mentioned. Then we have a curious reference in the Gaon to when... Uh, referring to Jesus say, saying that he is in the fourth heaven. Fourth heaven? Then we have the, light, the night journey of Muhammad and we have an account of the Enoch's ascent through the seven heavens. And basically that it says each heaven has a throne and on that throne is a prophet of God. And it talks about Adam who in a Islamic terms is a mess messenger, a manifestation of God, not the Adam, the limited Adam we have knowledge of from the Bible and from, through the church traditions. That's quite different. And uh, then uh, he talks about uh, Moses and Abraham and Christ, Christ being the fourth. Fifth heaven is Muhammad. Sixth heaven is the Bab. Seventh heaven is Baha'u'llah, seven heavens. Okay. So what might be the implications? 
This isn't going to help your five-year plan, I'm sorry to say, probably. But <laughs> implications of Baha'u'llah uniting these heavens of distinct religions into the, uh, our universal concept, into a fuller view that they're all part of the same faith. And so there's a great rejoicing throughout the spiritual realms. So if you, can, if you find any good confirmations for that, please send them to me. That's, that's my question at the moment. Doesn't really. I mean, that's not very helpful to what we're trying to do in this world, but it is a fascinating subject. Friends, thank you so much for a lovely week, and i very, very appreciative of your patience in trying to follow whatever it I've been trying to say. And I just, uh, I just, I enjoy traveling around the world and sharing with the friends to the degree that I can the zest I have for the beauty and the truth of the Baha'i Revelation and its teachings. This is a marvelous thing that we have. Thank you so much. <laughs>